Honda in the evening. Uh -huh. Basically had dinner, went to bed, got up the next morning, and I was out playing in front of the market by my place, and uh, people started gathering around before I'd even gotten the saxophone out of the case. And, um, you know, I was like, holy crap, it's working. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, other things I did there were uh, I, I formed, you know, relationships with other musicians, so I, I performed with them. Uh, to me, most importantly, that would be uh, a woman named Sophie who plays in Nanga. Okay. It's uh, kind of this sort of little bowl, not very deep, more like a plate, I would say, a, a plate about shaped like this is the instrument? Or? Yeah, with okay. one string wrapped around it ten times. Wow. And uh, it makes very nice sound, and uh, so I had a lot of fun playing with her. She doesn't speak English or French. She only speaks Kenya Rwanda, so we've always had trouble communicating. <laughs> I could imagine. <laughs> it's very fun playing together. Uh, we've recorded a little bit, and I hope we'll do more. I also uh, did some jazz workshops with some musicians there. I collaborated with uh, Children's Dance and Drumming Group. Okay. And uh, we made a film. I collaborated with a Rwandan filmmaker, Daddy Ruhorahosa. And uh, that film premiered at the 2010 Zanzibar International Film Festival. Mm -hmm. It's basically just a few minutes of talking and the rest of it is all sort of scenes from the uh, from the parade, mm -hmm. if you could say. I, I visited uh, a genocide memorial Ships 
with in contact with, did they view you differently on the on that return visit? Or uh, well, they knew who I was now. Okay, was <laughs> that always helps. This yeah. was a funny thing because you know uh, I didn't know anyone the first time I went, and okay. uh, then my first day back in Rwanda this time, I played out on the street downtown Kigali the first day, and someone said, "Welcome back." <laughs> wow. <laughs> Someone had just out on the street you you hadn't. Uh, yeah, I didn't recognize this person. But they recognized you. Yeah. Wow. So uh, you make um, a couple visits uh, to Africa, mm -hmm. and now sort of the next phase, you're looking to uh, set foot on another continent here for That's a period right. of one. Uh, what's what's the next frontier? Well, the next frontier is Southeast Asia, particularly Cambodia and Vietnam. Because I consider the Parade of One project, it's not region-based, it's theme-based. Uh, you know, it's, the goal is to engage post-conflict societies, wherever they might be, with uh, musical performance on the street level. <clears throat> so, there will be some similarities, I think, to what we've seen in Rwanda, um, especially in Cambodia, uh, where there was another case of victims and perpetrators you know, living together, and uh, Cambodia is still prosecuting its war criminals from the time of the Khmer Rouge that's going on right now. Still? And, yeah, the Khmer Rouge wasn't technically entirely defeated until uh, 98 or something like that. I mean, they were weak mm -hmm. at the, for many years before that. But and they're still, you said they're still prosecuting. Yeah, well, they have to find people who are in hiding. Uh -huh. Same thing with Rwanda. There's Rwanda wants people who are hiding in Europe and America or okay. hiding in other African countries. Yeah. Things like this. So it, wow. it's a process, I mean, I, I know from being related to Holocaust survivors that this process of something like this goes on a long time. Mm -hmm. Some people in Rwanda or about Rwanda will say 15 years ago, so long ago, but to the people who experienced it, it's nothing, you know. Um, getting to Vietnam, though, it's going to be in a lot of ways a different ballpark. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in Rwanda and Cambodia, you could say I'm the sympathetic observer okay. to uh, the conflicts that happened there, or the post-conflict situation. Whereas in Vietnam, as a U.S. citizen, you know, I, I'm a former adversary, um, and uh, my father was drafted. He is mm -hmm. a veteran of the Vietnam War, and um, so I think when I say I'm in Rwanda or Cambodia, thinking that my music is going to build community among these people, it's a little different in Vietnam because I'm hoping that my music will build community and I'm in that community. Mm -hmm. you know? Instead of sort of being outside this community building, you're actually directly... I'm, I'm, a, I'm one of the people. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Uh, have you talked to your, does your father know you're going to uh, Vietnam? And if so, how does he feel about that? I mean, as a... Uh-huh. Well, it, it was his suggestion okay. that I go there. When I got back from Rwanda the first time, he said, you should go to Vietnam. And, you know, um, I wasn't quite there in my mind yet. The proximity to Cambodia definitely helped my uh, decision because, you know, Cambodia is a little more similar to mm -hmm. what I've done before. I mean, with obvious cultural differences between yeah. the two places. Um, but he's pretty excited for it. He, he wants to help out however he can. He doesn't plan on joining me. Okay. <laughs> but uh, he, he invited me to go to the VA near where he lives with him. Uh -huh. And uh, I'm sure we'll be talking a lot about it. Um, you know, like most Vietnam vets, he doesn't speak much about what happens there. It's, mm -hmm. it's very dark, and then uh, you have this problem, which we don't have any more, but from that war, when the soldiers got back, they were mistreated. They were treated pretty badly. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of politicians 